Welcome everyone to our second webinar of the webinar series on agricultural value chains. So the second webinar today deals actually with the topic gender in value chains. And as evidence grows um, about the importance of women as key agents in agriculture, food security and also in nutrition, more agricultural value chain projects are striving to address gender as well. Well, yet projects even with stated goals for benefiting women and women empowerment very greatly in their objectives as well as the activities and the ways of measuring their work. And of course, there are quite a few challenges that need to be overcome uh, in order to integrate gender in a sustainable way and monitor, monitor the results, of course, accordingly. In order to approach this complex theme of gender and value chains, um, we have today Andreas springer Heinze. Senior Planning Officer at GIZ and author of the Value Links Methodology, as well as Alphonse Eiligmann, who is a board member of the International Value Links Association and a Value Links Master Trainer. They will answer us some questions today on the integration of gender aspects into value chains from a Value Links Methodology perspective. So, what is important? How can opportunities be exploited? Furthermore, we will have Caroline Trimborn, who is technical advisor for the Green Innovation Centers in Nigeria, and she will give us some project insight with regard to challenges, success stories, and also lessons learned with regard to integrating gender into their project activities. Andreas, the first question is actually for you. So why are gender issues important in value chain promotion? Yeah, um, gender is really high up in the development agenda, Karina. We all see that. Uh, and I think there are good reasons for it. Um, I have here five points on the slide that you see before you. The first one, obviously, men and women play different roles in economic and social life. Uh, if you look um, closer at value chains in most economies, we observe a gender-specific division of tasks, men and women taking different roles in the economy, particularly in traditional agriculture, um, where that is obvious, but mind you, also in global manufacturing. If you look at uh, food processing, toys, textiles, wherever manual skills are required, you find a female workforce very typically. So um, it, is, it remains to be true that there is a difference between men and women in economic life, and we have to take that into account. Um, it implies that whenever we do value chain development, it will affect those gender relations and that we have to take it into account in our, in our programs. Uh, the impact of value chain development can both be positive and negative. Unless we understand what is actually going on and um, understand the situation, uh, the gender situation well, we will not find appropriate strategies. And of course, we want the impact to be positive. Um, and if we uh, look at the situation, it's not just a question of gender equity. Um, women contribute to economic growth and sustainable development, very importantly so, because uh, they have roles in natural resource management, in agriculture, in trade very often, and of course in nutrition and childcare. And it means only if we involve women in sustainable development We'll make a contribution and uh, move forward. Um, one aspect in that is uh, that value chain developments, uh, development offers opportunities to female entrepreneurs. That is a more specific answer to the point. Um, uh, it is one of the strategies that we are looking into, and Alphonse will speak more about this later. Uh, at the very least, and that would be the ultimate argument, uh, we have to avoid any unintended negative outcomes. Uh, it can be that if we look into value chain innovations, um, that that improvement or an improvement that we want to be an improvement, in fact, turns out uh, to uh, mean more work for women, which would be something, a negative outcome uh, that we have to avoid in value chain development. So different arguments uh, why I think that uh, that topic is so important now. I have another question, actually. How can we tackle the gender question in value chain development and what does Value Links offer? 
Um, well, gender had not been uh, covered in the earlier version of uh, Value Links when we started it. Uh, we definitely uh, wanted to uh, fill that point in. Uh, also, there has been some criticism on not looking closely enough into the gender aspect. Now, the first observation, of course, is uh, that gender is a cross-cutting topic in development, and so it is for value chain development. You find gender issues at every point. Nevertheless, um, we want to produce uh, something useful and provide tools to practitioners, and that applied um, particularly to two of the value links modules, um, value chain analysis and value chain strategies. Um, in each of these two modules, uh, we've introduced one particular chapter on first gender analysis in module two and, gen and then also gender strategies in module three. Uh, what does that mean? Um, it means including gender-specific value chain mapping tools, um, understanding the situation, social and economic situation of gender groups in value chains, describing the economic position of women, their household and livelihood situation. That's part of the value chain analysis, and we've uh, put emphasis on that one. Uh, and then when it comes to strategic options, constraints, opportunities, of those gender groups and the strategic options um, that are available for value chain development according to those gender groups. Now, of course, um, as I said, it's a cross-cutting issue, so it pops up everywhere. And um, we therefore said, let's not make a chapter, a specific chapter everywhere, but look at those issues, the important issues in all the other uh, modules uh, uh, where gender should appear as an as an issue and concern that has to be considered um, whether we look at the selection of value chains uh, for a promotion, a program design, or come up with particular value chain solutions, every time we have to take that into account. So it has become an important general concern in value links by now. Now, Alphonse, can you give us some examples on how actually to select the right value chains with a gender perspective? Um, in fact, Andreas started with value chain analysis, but uh, I would say there's one step before that. There's uh, the value chain selection, uh, which is already important uh, in order to ensure that we later on reach enough impact on women and gender. And for this value chain selection, Value Links 2.0 has a tool. It's this ILOGIZ um a value chain selection matrix that you can see here now on the screen, which has a category which is called social criteria. And uh, that means, first of all, in Value Links 2.0, each time when we do a value chain selection, um, the gender issue is already automatically part of the process if we apply the tools uh, that we foresee. Second, if we want to um, increase particularly our uh, gender um, as, um, aspect, our gender perspe uh, perspective, if we have a special aim, objective to promote gender, we can still uh, do two things. Um, first of all, we can uh, define the criteria in this category of social criteria more or less exclusively regarding gender criteria. We are not talking about general poverty alleviation criteria, for instance, but we just zoom in on gender criteria. And uh, we've presented here four uh, criteria that we would assume to be uh, key, like number one, the high share of women employed or women entrepreneurs in the value chain, meaning we should select a value chain where women play an important role in any case in the value chain. Number two, it's a question whether the value chain offers better or less good potential for income generation, specifically for women. Uh, number three, it's a question in which value chains women have more control over equipment, assets, and sales income, um, so that they are more in the driver's seat in the value chain. And uh, the fourth criterion here I also find quite important the possibilities to improve working and living conditions of women, meaning that um, if we have a value chain, like for instance the garment uh, industry or a garment industry value chain, um, 
where we would have very poor working conditions of employees, of women employees in the value chain, this could be even a positive criteria to take up this value chain because there is a lot of room for improvement. I think this came particularly from the ILO perspective that um, even value chains that have a particular problem also on uh, working conditions or on the gender issue, we can select if we see really there's room for improvement, so possibilities to improve. And the second point, how we could um, make sure that the gender perspective is more important in the value chain selection is we can just change uh, the weighting that is applied here. In this example from the GIZ ILO guidelines, it's 0 0.25. Um, what we can do is just increase this to, I don't know, 0 0.35, 0 0.4 by reducing at the same time uh, the weighting of other categories of uh, selection criteria. This way we can ensure that um, the relevance of gender criteria is more prominent in the value chain selection and we will get in the, the possibility to promote value chains that are more suitable for women. Andreas, back to you. Let's start so with the value chain analysis, actually. What do we have to know to actually understand the situation of women and the challenges for value chain development better? Uh, it is clear that when we want to fill in on the uh, issues and criteria that Alphonse just mentioned, um, we have to study uh, the value chain. We have to do a gender study of the value chain in order to find out. And the first tool with which we always start, the key tool in value chain analysis, is of course value chain mapping. Uh, what you see here in the slide before you is a value chain map, simplified for sure, uh, that talks about rice, the product that uh, it deals with, and then has uh, the key elements, markets, urban market, local market, um, functions on top of the different value chain stages, uh, the value chain actors and their relationships, their linkages. Um, now, for a gender analysis, uh, we look particularly at the actors. So the value chain map as such remains as it is. And now the question is, what roles do men and women have in the system? Look at the actors and determine who is male or female in the business. Now, um, it makes, of course, a big difference whether someone owns or runs a business or is a worker or family member. Um, so the way how we could indicate that in a value chain map very simply is by putting in the gender symbols and uh, one option is to put a gender symbol above the yellow uh, uh, rectang rectangle just indicating who is owning that business or he, who is in charge uh, and then within into the yellow box um, who are the workers, the employees and also family members. That's an easy way to complement an existing value chain. Uh, so it's just one step more. Um, and of course, as we do that uh, and find out who's who in the value chain, um, it could turn out that in some instances uh, we have both men and women involved. So a possible next step could be to further differentiate a value chain map. Um, as you can see, for example, both men and women are active in rice trade. When it comes to wholesale trade, you see a small um, box below wholesale traders. There are both men and women trading in rice. Should we make two yellow boxes here, one for men and one for women? That's a question, and it very much depends on what we want to achieve in value chain analysis, how far we go with making such differentiations. Well, uh, based on the value chain map, uh, then... Uh, we find out who is who, who are the gender groups. And as I said already, at the level of the value chain operators, basically three economic functions that are of interest to us. Women as value chain operators, as female entrepreneurs, for sure a very important and key role that is of interest here. Second, women as family members, particularly unpaid family, member in far family labor in farms, um, and then women as employees or workers. Of course, you could also say men and women, uh, depending on what you are looking for. But um, 
I think women is what uh, comes to mind first because uh, they are normally in a position that is uh, more difficult in economic life in many countries. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we also have beyond the micro level um, representation in business organizations and associations. Um, and that would be a separate step, uh, not yet um, included in the value chain map that I just presented. Um, so having identified um, those roles and gender groups, um, through the value chain mapping, we have uh, answered the first question, what roles do men and women typically play in the value chain? We now have to look at what those roles involve and what they imply. And of course, uh, let's start with female or male entrepreneurs. The question is, are there any differences in the access to inputs, in the access to support services, to financial services, to market linkages, um, in the capital uh, they can build? Um, there are big differences, possibly. We have to know that. Um, and then we go on with other uh, gender groups. Um, second point, uh, at the enterprise level, what are the shares of men and women in different categories of jobs? Um, in processing, uh, in storage, in management, uh, there are differences, obviously, in what you do, uh, what the recruitment policies, the employment conditions are, the payment, working hours, particularly working hours and uh, the job conditions are uh, important for women who have children to care for. And uh, so we also see it from a social side, not only from a appointment paid of view, point of view. Um, that social condition leads us to the third point, the household level. Um, so we talk now about family members. Um, who cares for children and does the family work, say, in a farm? Those reproductive tasks and how many hours a day are spent on these tasks. Um, this is a very important question because very often when we look at agricultural development and agricultural value chains, we look at innovations in farms. And the question is, do they involve more work and a bigger workload for women? That's a big question. And how does that compare then to other tasks they have? And do women, in fact, participate in financial and investment decisions uh, that are at the basis of our value chain work? And then the other category, um, civil society and business organizations, any gender-specific um, organizations beyond the micro level? Um, do we have women's groups? Um, and also uh, the question, who is active in service provision? Let's take the example of um, extension services. Um, are there women employed as extension workers? Um, in agriculture, that may be a big difference, uh, whether you are female or male. Uh, or both uh, gender involved in extension work. That's just an example. So we have to look, after having identified gender roles and gender groups, you have to look in detail into the specific conditions in order to address them according to those conditions they live in and they work in. I imagine we are working already on a value chain that offers quite some opportunities. And we also know the situation. What can we do now? I think Andreas explained very well how we analyze the value chain. And now we change our perspective and we go one step further. We look into the future. We ask ourselves the question, what can be done to improve the situation? Um, and we call this strategic considerations. We assess strategic considerations um, for gender-sensitive value chain development. And the first one is here the value chain economic opportunities, meaning what um, major economic opportunities uh, can we identify for increasing the income of women in the value chain? Um, where do we have possibilities to remove barriers of economic development? Uh, what can be changed? What can be improved? What market potential can be utilized? Uh, number two, Andreas already talked about the analysis of uh, the role of women in the household. Also, there is a question, uh, to what extent can this be changed? What windows of opportunities are there? Uh, for instance, I once saw a project where 
there was a very strong migration of husbands of uh, male actors in the value chain um, from the agricultural sector to construction work, uh, migration even to other countries. And this meant that a lot of um, economic resources were suddenly available and not used, and uh, women could utilize, uh, had much better access to these resources uh, and, could and could use this. And we also have to take into consideration for any kind of development, institutional and cultural factors um, that may influence as well the discussion. So these are three parts of um, strategic considerations, and these we will discuss. Um, we will see what major issues can we identify there, what major opportunities, and then we transform this into what we call strategic options, uh, what you see at the bottom part of the value chain. And we would say, in general, Karina, still go back, please. Um, in general, we would talk about two major um, options, one that we call supporting entrepreneurship of women, uh, because we see there um, that a lot of possibilities are there in general, and also a lot of projects work in such a direction. So this, we would say, is one option. And the other option is what we call gendered chain development projects and programs, where the strategy includes the strategic considerations for gender-sensitive development, as we just discussed. And uh, I would still like to show you, uh, Karina, um, one other slide here uh, that is called the metrics of systemic competitiveness. And a colleague of mine, Rabba El Fukari, in uh, Morocco once presented this slide in a seminar for val uh, gender sensitive value chain development. I like it because it's a very simple, clear, and straightforward matrix. Uh, you have the four levels uh, that we usually assess micro, meso, macro, plus the meta level for these cultural and social values. And then to see at each of these four levels, what are strong points and opportunities for improving the role of women in the value chain? And on the other side, what are uh, constraints? What are weak uh, points uh, for improving the role of women in the value chain? And um, I just like it because I think it's, it's very simple as a tool uh, that we can use in workshops um, to ask the actors in the value chain what are the main issues that you can identify um, according to each level. And this would be for us the starting point um, to discuss the strategic considerations. Um, I have another question actually for you. So how can we ensure that the voice of women is heard in the strategy development process? I think um, I would like to give you one example of um, a work that we did in northern Côte d'Ivoire. We are here in um, the onion value chain and you see uh, a number of women group representatives um, planting onions um, in the dry season usually. Um, and in this case, our consultant had identified um, a good market opportunity for off-season production of onions during the rainy season, uh, prices three times higher than uh, during the dry season, less workload, no irrigation needed, a lot of advantages. And we organized in a project planning seminar, in a value chain upgrading strategy seminar, a meeting only with the women representatives of the actors in the value chain uh, to capture their point um, whether this would be a good idea or not. And I still remember very well that in the discussion, uh, the women were not so much talking about um, whether the prices would be three times higher during the rainy season, uh, whether there would be less workload or not. Their main problem was that during the rainy season, their husbands would expect them to work in the maize field of their husband and uh, would not like it if uh, they are not respecting their general traditional role and instead focus on their own economic activities. And we learned during that time that this reflection for the women was the most important one uh, in terms of whether they should start a new uh, production of off-season vegetables or not. And um, 
I think in the strategy development process, it's very important that we have some formats where we listen carefully to um, the women in the value chain and take time to really understand their point of view um, and get a feeling for what they are ready to do and what they want to do. And in this case, after a long discussion, they said, well, no, we can try. We can start with some smaller plots of land um, and we will do that. But gender sensitive strategy design for value chain upgrading, I think we need some special formats where also from time to time we separate male and female actors in the process uh, of coming up with a strategy to get this idea. One last question before we come to the questions of the audience here. So how can we monitor and evaluate gender-sensitive value chain promotion? I think for monitoring gender-sensitive value chain uh, promotion, we need gender disaggregated data. We need them uh, disaggregate, disaggregated in terms of income, but also in terms of access to resources and how this changed and improved in terms of the number of women entrepreneurs at different stages of the value chain, in terms of the organization level of women, like uh, producer groups, women producer groups. And um, I don't have a particular example here, but uh, we did a project evaluation last year where GIZ program had the overall goal the poor rural population, especially women, uh, has increased its income and overcome poverty. And, um, and this project um, had good monitoring data in terms of the number of women producers uh, that participated in the project, 50%, but the project did not come up with gender disaggregated income data. And... Uh, I think that we see this still quite often that um, we don't have these gender disaggregated data and this is something what would be needed. I start with the power relations issue. Um, of course, with gender mapping, you can do certain things, identify groups, as I explained first, um, but not necessarily look into social relations beyond what is expressed in the value chain map. Now, if you look at economic power, then the linkages tell us something. Uh, so depending on what position you have in the value chain in trade or in production, then the linkage, the analysis of Business linkages can tell us also something about gender relations to the extent that the operators are either men or, or women. But otherwise, uh, I think we have to look into social relations at the household level, which, of course, you can't uh, do as an analysis within value chain mapping. This is also the reason why I said, yes, it's a key tool. It's a tool to start with. But, uh, of course, uh, if you want uh, to go further ahead and do a more complete gender analysis, then uh, you'll have to have other tools and look into those groups and their social conditions in particular. Uh, the other question that looked into the avocado value chain and the fact that there are only 5% of organized female farmers, as I understand, um, well, <clears throat> if this is a fact, uh, then we first have to recognize that fact. It would be part of a value chain analysis, a gender value chain analysis to find out. The interesting question is, why is that so? Are there reasons why uh, women uh, don't engage in avocado farming? Does it have to do with land rights, with traditions? Is it just a matter of organization? Because uh, the question talked about organized farmers. We would have to look at those reasons. But even more importantly, I would say that we are looking really at the value chain at large and uh, not just at production. So we don't talk about farming alone. Uh, we talk about all kinds of economic roles and tasks uh, that um, are performed. And it could well be, as we see in many food and agriculture value chains, that women are more, more active in, in trade, for example. We had that in potatoes in Nigeria recently where exactly that was the case um, in a Muslim environment where there's difficult land access to women, land rights issues. It was, it was much more complicated for them to engage in potato farming, but instead you find them very active in uh, potato processing and trade. So um, let's then be more complete in our analysis of value chain and, uh, and be complete on, 
all the groups that we find. Uh, of course, and that may be a last uh, remark on what we can do. I think we cannot uh, really change um, basic patterns of social life and cultural traditions in a country through a value chain promotion project, particularly if it is a short period of time. So let's stick to what we can do within the value chain framework. And I think in many instances that will mean to accept the conditions that we can't um, have impact on. Let me take up uh, the question, first question of Anne regarding um, how to address female actors involved in the informal sector. Um, I would just involve them um, as regular actors in the value chain. I think it's important already in the analysis uh, if there is a strong uh, part of informal uh, actors in the value chain to differentiate between formal and informal actors in the value chain to show the informal actors clearly in the value chain map to assess their uh, specific situation to invite them uh, to a formal uh, project design meetings as a group of actors um, and then it's a question what kind of specific upgrading activities can be part of the upgrading strategy for this group of informal value chain actors um, I once worked in a project in Cambodia on where there were a lot of informal weavers in the textile industry and uh, one of our solutions was to help part of them to become formal actors in the value chain. And this is very often in line with uh, government objectives at the same time. So, um, and otherwise, of course, it depends on what value chain, what informal actors, but uh, whether they are formal or informal, legal or illegal, they are actors in the value chain, and I would take them in a neutral way, include them in the project planning. Maybe I can take up the other question on negative uh, effects and the, and how to sensitize for potential negative impact of value chain development. And obviously, yes, we are talking about value chain uh, development and what it can mean. Uh, this is really the essence of being gender sensitive, I would think. Uh, my recommendation is that we should really look at the strategies, the interventions, the value chain solutions that we plan to support. Um, in the green innovation centers, we talk about innovations, technological innovations, organizational innovations. Uh, let's look at those technical innovations more in detail and ask now, what does it change in uh, the, uh, the division of tasks? Who has to do what after that innovation has been introduced? Uh, Let's be concrete. Um, we have maybe a cash crop uh, that is uh, a cash crop uh, uh, grown by uh, the male farm household chief. Um, and um, that uh, cash crop and the value chain work that we are doing on it involves increasing production, bringing up productivity and seeking market linkages. Now, the question is, what does that mean? For women involved in that very crop, do they also have to invest more time in uh, harvesting, in the care for the crop? Uh, and maybe that would take time away from other tasks they have. Um, or it could mean that in the distribution of resources available at farm level, much more would go into that particular cash crop. Um, capital, for example, you have to save money in order to invest into buying inputs. Um, so if we ask for capital formation, where does that capital, where does that money come from? Is it being withdrawn from other activities? Uh, it's that kind of intra-household considerations that would have to complement complement um, our idea on a on a on an innovation. Let's let's look into it from a livelihood perspective, from a household perspective, uh, and and study uh, the relations uh, more in detail. I think that is what we mean by gender sensitive, uh, and it may shed a completely new light on a particular innovation that we have in mind. Welcome, everyone. Um, I will give a brief overview um, on our project, the Green Innovation Center for the Agriculture and Food Sector in Nigeria, and then um, introduce one gender sensitive approach, the processor business school that we are using and um, yeah, share some learnings. Just a brief overview um, on our program. <laughs> 
Um, as um, Andreas already mentioned, um, we have the objective to uh, promote innovations um, that will improve smallholder incomes and employment in the agriculture and food sector. And um, uh, as Andreas mentioned, we are looking not just at technical innovations, but also organizational and um, institutional innovations. Our target group um, is quite ambitious, so we try to reach out to 200,000 um, smallholder farmers via direct trainings and 400,000 via ICT trainings. As I've highlighted, we have disaggregated this, so we try to reach out to 35% women and also um, young men and women. Um, apart from the agriculture, <laughs> small herders so primary production, we are also working with association, um, processing enterprise and input suppliers. So it's, as you already can see, following a value chain approach. And we're also working with up and downstream enterprises. Um, our intervention zones um, in Nigeria, we um, work with in four different value chains. So it's the rice, maize, cassava, and Irish potato value chain. And um, yeah, our regions are across Nigeria. Um, as you can see on the map, I won't go into detail on this. Um, yeah, our intervention areas is that we are basically focusing in A on um, uh, innovations that improve productivity and income for smallholder farmers, so primary production, then in our intervention area B, um, we um, promote innovations that increase productivity, actually, yeah, in, uh, productivity and employment for actors of up and downstream enterprises. And then uh, in C, we promote um, advocacy activities and in D, um, the, we make use of our global program or our structure as a global program. So we are one um, center um, or like one country package in Nigeria, one of 14th. So um, we have like a component where we try to make use of learnings in the 13 other countries. Coming now um, to our intervention points, um, I think here it's important to see that we're already like following uh, a value chain logic. So um, the levels mentioned by Alphonse, um, the micro, meso, and macro level, we try to um, work in these levels and Yes, like a small overview where we are actually working. So we try to focus on um, each level. And um, now I will highlight two of them because this is now the specific um, yeah, activity that we're doing. And it's the Processor Business School. So the Processor Business School is... Um, <laughs> a business skills training for cottage processor and it's based on the principles of the pharma business school and um, so it looks as cottage processing as a business so during this training cottage processors are um, encouraged um, to learn through money out and mo money in and money out exercises to see whether they're doing good business and how they can improve their business so we also uh, include cost of improved equipment so so we try to sensitize for um, yeah, improved equipment and also um, there's a component of, of management for better food, food, better and healthy foods. This is the menu and then this is like um, uh, an interesting fact which um, yeah, I wanted to share. So. Um, as I will explain later on, this um, training approach uh, was not developed um, in our program, but we um, collaborated with another program, and um, it's the Competitive African Rice Initiative Program, and they're part of an umbrella program, and they have submitted, um, I think, a collection of different um, gender activities, and the PBS was one of them, and it just recently won the first prize in the gender competition. And here, I just want to share one <coughs> of our beneficiaries, so um, that you can see um, who is like our more typical target group within this um, approach. 
And um, so we have a Gari processor and um, there, as you can see here, one of her improvements is that she is now applying more hygienic processing methods. So this is like the improved processing that we try to sensitize for. And um, then you can also see that it was um, earlier produced mainly for home consumption, but now she also tries to increase her production and see cassava processing as a business. Now I want to go into a bit more detail how we um, implement this approach here in Nigeria. So the first step was actually um, to conduct a value chain analysis together with our stakeholders during national and regional workshops. Um, this is like uh, was done in 2015 and 16 and um, is following the value links approach. So I didn't put um, the map here again, but it's actually pretty similar to the one that um, Andreas already presented on RISE. So um, we did this for our value chains and um, identified then that cottage processing is a major female activity and that there is like an income increasing potential. And the next step, we decided uh, or we had like exchange with other programs because the um, yeah, innovation centers are designed in a way that we um, yeah, collaborate with programs that are already on the ground um, to actually pick up innovations and disseminate them. And um, so we had like an exchange with, um, especially as I mentioned before, the Competitive African Rice Initiative. There are a regional program focusing on rice. And um, they had like uh, also a focus on some gender activities due to a co-financing component. So um, during this exchange, um, we developed like the Processor Business School and um, another collaboration that I want to mention here is like uh, the false bottom technology. It's an improved technology that we integrated into the curricula and that is promoted um, by the Japan, Japan International Corporation Agency, JICA. So in the next step, uh, we coming from the rice value chain and therefore that we're operating in four value chain, we discussed uh, and how we can adapt this material also to other value chains. And we started this in 2016 to adapt it to the cassava value chain. So from the rice processing, which is made on parboiling, we adapted this to um, gari processing. And for this, um, we used our farmer business school manual and also a, a, a manual on good agriculture practice from another regional program, the SSIB, Sustainable Smallholder Agribusiness Program on GARI. So, <laughs> and having developed had these two training approaches, we implemented TOTs and trainings in 2017. And um, here you can see our outreach for this year, uh, for the last year, like 2017. So um, we trained um, <coughs> 1,638 um, um, processors in uh, power, rice parboiler processors and um, also uh, roughly the same number in gari processing. And as you can see, um, we um, try, we have gender aggregated data on this and um, the female participation in the um, trainings is, um, yeah, very high, I would say. Now we're going all already a bit into future is now <coughs> that we look um, of continuous M and E of the trainings. And um, so we already had stakeholder. Um, we constantly have uh, like t t every t uh, half year we have stakeholder meetings where we discuss all our interventions. So this is a really good platform um, to also get feedback on our activities. Apart from this, we um, are planning to have a gender sensitive impact assessment uh, beginning of this year. And there will be also an adoption survey um, conducted by Kari and Jaika. And in the next step, um, we plan now also to adapt the training material again, which is based on some learnings that we already had, um, especially, for example, from the stakeholder workshops. So um, what we had 
discussed is, for example, to include a module on healthy nutrition because this was voiced by some of the processors um, or the female uh, processors that they would like to have this module, which is also part in the uh, Pharma Business School. And we also plan to um, include the contacts of the fabricators for this um, false bottom technology, which is like an improved technology so that um, they can also already have this um, fabricators there um, in the manual and can, con can contact them on their own. So this is how we um, implemented the approach so far. And um, in the next slides, I would like to share what our learnings are um, on from this, what we have um, but exactly. So um, I think a first very important point that um, I would like to share is that, um, yeah, we had like the application of the value chain perspective was very relevant for us. Um, and what is important to consider is that, um, yeah, we used the value chain al analysis already as a starting point. So this was actually the basis for our intervention. So, and this all helped, yeah, was very helpful, um, to ad identify like the, the sectors and the actors, uh, and how that we want to work with. And, um, yeah, helped us to design the strategy. So in the next step, what would be important is um, that we validate, like, that it's the value chain approach is very helpful to also um, validate intervention points uh, in other value chains. So if you want to upscale your innovations and um, you look for intervention points, the value chain analysis method is really um, helpful to also identify, okay, if you, for example, have the learning there's like a female processing um, uh, is a major activity in rice. Um, this was very helpful to also see that this is, um, yeah, a major activity in cassava as well. And this would be a good starting point to also implement activities in this regard. Um, and what also is very helpful, um, coming from a value chain perspective is that you, um, yeah, facilitating business linkages. And this is, for example, um, yeah, that they, um, they are working on uh, applicators um, that can develop this uh, improved technology, and um, we try to link them to the smallholders farmers. So this linkage is also really important, and the value chain approach is sensitizing you for this. Um, in the next, what is also very important, um, or we learned during the process, is to have a continuous stakeholder consultation. So as already mentioned, we have, um, or it would, what we would suggest is like to involve the stakeholders from the beginning, um, already in the value chain um, mapping exercise, because this really helps you to um, identify strategic um, intervention points. Um, also relevant um, is present the approach and success stories and invite beneficiaries to stakeholder meetings for exchange. So this is where we had immediate um, feedback on our um, activity um, because the implementation of like impact assessments um, is already like uh, always taking some time. And I think if you have a lot of channels for immediate feedback is um, really helpful. And this was also helpful for us to, um, as I already mentioned, to include other um, content to the curricula. Already um, indicated before, what is also very relevant is the collaboration with other programs. Um, so I think it was for us really helpful to see, okay, what are other programs doing with regards to gender-specific activities? And um, so that's where we, um, yeah, had the insights from Kari, for example. Um, then what you can see on two um, yeah, uh, occasions is that we make use of already available materials and we just customized it. So um, as I mentioned, we use the FBS and the technical training approach to bring it together to the um, F um, Processor Business School on Cassava. So this was also very helpful. And... Um, in exactly the last learning uh, in regard to collaboration with other programs would be um, that we try to learn from other impact. Um, as mentioned, 
already, Kari is also implementing this um, approach, and they are um, about to implement an adoption survey, um, and we plan to also um, learn from these impacts. So because they their trainings, um, they have implemented trainings already like two years ago, I think, yes. So um, they're just at another project cycle, and um, we can make use of this also. Next learning would be um, that we looked at innovations for scaling up. So what was very relevant for us is like to identify a cost-efficient training approach for large-scale outreach. Um, as you can see on the numbers, um, we already have reached um, uh, more than 3,000 processors, and um, we are just at the starting. So this was just like the first season, and we try to, uh, or we will increase this. So um, in the next step, uh, what also I think was very important is use affordable technology. So we screened the technologies um uh, yeah, to make sure that we have like um, technology that is really also available for the processors. So because there is, um, yeah, it doesn't make sense to um, promote technology that wouldn't be available on the market. And um, with the collaboration with JICA um, and their trainings for fabricators, we made sure, um, yeah, sure that they were like um, – the, the tech, technology was not just affordable, but also available. Um, innovations for scaling up, very relevant, is also that you look for um, ways how you can transfer knowledge from one value chain to another value chain. And um, this is what we did um, from Rice to Cassava. And yeah, this would be actually then the last point. Um, I think what was very relevant for us is um, coming out from all these learnings that continuous learning should be or was is guiding our implementations. And um, yeah, we're still like in the learning process on this. And um, yeah, these are I think would say our learnings so far. And now I'm also interested to see what your what we can learn from you. So our approach is that we're working um, with the ADPs, like the state extension agents, and uh, we have trained them already in two training approaches um, for primary production, um, the good agriculture practice training and the pharma business goods training. So we also choose uh, to um, qualify them for the processor business school so that this knowledge is also institutionalized into the um, state extension system. And um, so that's like why we are choosing them. And um, regarding the uh, men and women, um, I think we ha like, I have the figures, for example, for rice, we have just male trainers. And for cassava, we have, um, I think, 20% female trainers. So this is something <laughs> that we, um, yeah, is based on the structure of the extension service. And this is something we want to look at now in the next cy cycle as we do our gender sensitive um, impact assessment. This is uh, definitely one relevant po point where we want to look at and to see um, how we can, um, yeah, strengthen also the capacities of uh, our, I, yeah, female um, extension agents. But therefore, that we're working with the um, institutions, uh, we need to identify strategies um, or also see if we can come up with other trainers outside the state extension um, services. But for us, it would be really relevant now to see the difference also from male trained um, groups and uh, female trained groups. Power balance of men and women. This would be exactly the same where, why we look, want to have this um, impact assessment um, because this is uh, like we don't have any information on this yet and we need to have more qualitative uh, data and this is uh, what will be the next step and implemented in the yeah, next month. Um, I think I now just highlighted um, our yeah, specific female activity and we have st a strong emphasis on um, production and processing. And now in cycle, we will also look at other parts of the value chain. 
So, I mean, we have a business approach. So what we're actually doing is to sensitize farmers where they can, um, yeah, make business with and where are, and these are the linkages like to the market. If you have like a, a quality product that you can, um, yeah, offer it to the market. We work, um, yeah, as I said, with the state extension. So they get their salary from um, the state. And um, what we do, we pa pay allowances for each training. So um, we try to support them to conduct um, these trainings, um, also um, with regards to transport and communication, because they're also trained in um, setting up WhatsApp groups, so to use uh, modern technologies for their extension services. So to they get allowances to improve the quality of the training because they're like um, there's no budget in the system to allow for this. And, um, yeah, so it's basically contributions from two ends. They are paid also by the states, which makes it possible that we have this large-scale outreach. We're working with um, over 400 um, state extension agents. Um, maybe just a few remarks uh, complementing what, of what I said earlier uh, on the role of um, the value chain approach for sustainable development. I, I think we are talking about the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic growth, inclus inclusion, inclusive development and ecological sustainability. And I think it's uh, the social side that counts for sure. We seek a better position of women in economic uh, life uh, at fair terms, inclusion at fair terms. So that's a that's certainly an, an important objective. But let's not forget um, that we also look at economic growth and uh, the role that women have in making economic growth possible. So I would also encourage uh, that strategic uh, option that we've developed to say, how can we make sure that uh, whatever we find important for value chain development, we involve women as active uh, partners and, and producers um, in that value chain. And uh, many of the tools that we have in value chain analysis and the solutions that we can have, uh, offer um, are applicable to both male and female-led enterprises. So it's a question of whether we utilize our methods and tools and also make them available to female entrepreneurs and uh, Otherwise, it may be the same technology, it may be the same recommendations, uh, but uh, it's the, the group that is interesting, uh, women as promoters of economic growth. Uh, so let's, let's see that there is a social side to it, but there is also an economic growth aspect uh, that we should not forget. Uh, maybe to add one point there, Andreas just said women as promoters of economic growth. And I noted that uh, Caroline's example was particularly on processing, um, processors of agricultural goods. And in the beginning, there was a, a remark from a participant, I think uh, Anna Summer, saying, what can we do in Ethiopia if uh, only 5% of our actors in the value chain of the farmers uh, in the avocado value chain are women and 95% are men. Um, I, th I think we see in many agricultural value chains that women play a particular role on promoting processing and thus also improving market access for the large number of farmers. Um, I would still be interested in knowing from Caroline whether um, they could compare some of data of the income of women processors with, on the other side, um, maybe male farmers in the value chains you are working with. I could imagine that um, as a Gari processor, even, okay, it's, it's handicraft activity, it's a small-scale artisanal activity, but um, isn't this something where also women sometimes can even generate higher income than the men and, um, and also uh -huh. get a stronger, more important role for the whole value chain? Um, yeah, I think um, we actually have our um, impact assessment goal for um, getting data on production in all the four value chains and also on these processing activities. So I think, um, yeah, these are very relevant questions that we then would look at um, to see where are better um, income opportunities. So it, it isn't set at all, and I guess uh, I think... Uh, Andreas can also share some insights because he was here to conduct um, a, a small study on um, these gender activities um, that there's also 
yeah, that the limit or the potential for uh, income increase is limited to a certain degree. So, um, yeah, so these are definitely questions that we will look at once we have like the results of our income, uh, of our impact assessment. Yeah. And probably Andre Andreas, you want to share something on this, um, as you have seen, for example, the situation with the rice parboiler here in Nigeria. Yeah, well, I don't have numbers. Uh, I can't give you numbers now, but um, it is true that uh, rice parboiling is not that remunerative for uh, many uh, women right now because um, the uh, scale of operation is also limited. And then um, uh, it is a question how we can improve the productivity of these businesses um, so that uh, higher income per working day would uh, be the result. I see a, a question by um, Henry also um, that looks at uh, the question of uh, inclusion and the, uh, and what it means in terms of uh, income. Um, it is true that we are not just looking for jobs, we are looking for productive jobs. And uh, so that brings us very much back to the question of business models and productive uh, business models, which is a, a big topic in uh, value chain development. That applies to both sexes. Um. Yeah, I also saw the comment of Henry Moria from Paraguay, far away. Um, so that, uh, yeah, uh, more participation, inclusion of women, but also more work for them. Example, cropping cassava is not a friendly job for women. Actually, that's something what, um, I like with value links two zero compared to value links one zero. In the past, we were really focusing on the economic opportunities, economic growth, uh, only. But uh, this is only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is also decent work conditions um, and uh, yeah, how to improve working conditions in the value chain. Uh, maybe not necessarily increasing uh, economic growth, but improving work conditions and to see what kind of techniques, technologies are important and uh, not to push, push, push the value chain uh, anyhow, but... Um, to do it in a way that uh, decent jobs are created. Therefore, I find this comment very important. Um, yeah, maybe from my side, uh, I think we shouldn't stretch the value chain approach too far. Um, there are certainly certainly many issues of gender equity in countries um, um, that uh, deserve to be looked into uh, in much more detail. Income distribution and uh, yeah, the family roles, etc., are highly cultural uh, question. I wonder whether we can address them through a value chain approach. It's not to say that this is not an issue, but uh, it's always been a question for us: how far do we take uh, the value chain concept? And I would think that. Uh, let's stick to the topic that is uh, the role of gender for value chain for value chain development and within value chains. Uh, that is not to say that that can cover every aspect. It's similar to the poverty uh, question, uh, where we've also seen that uh, we can't reach certain people uh, through market integration. Uh, so there is more to it than just value chain development, and I think that's also true for gender equity in particular. Um, I would like to add to that. Um, that's right, Andreas. But um, particularly you, also you say, you know, with what you have written in Value Links to Zero, that uh, we need some accompanying social interventions. So it's something the focus should be. It's an economic approach. It's about economic opportunities. But um, there are there may be a need for accompanying social interventions, like for nutrition. Um, trainings in, of uh, value chain actors and there can also be some um, empowerment of women to reduce income uh, in, uh, yeah, to improve the income distribution in the family. May absolutely, I, I agree. Uh, let me just uh, say yes, I absolutely agree and I think uh, when we talk about uh, design, a program design, we talk about combinations of uh, value chain development with other approaches that, that have to be in place as well. Yeah. And May yeah, I just to add on to this, this, because uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, there's also, uh, for example, the module on healthy nutrition is part of the um, PBS. So um, this is also, I think, a way of integrate 
discussing such topics. And the Pharma Business School um, is also such an example. Um, the ones who are familiar with the concept, um, there's not just like an emphasis on uh, money in and money out for the production, but also a financial calendar is um, part of the training where men and women together in the trainings are working on um, yeah, income and expenditures that are needed for the household uh, so that they're sensitized. If you have a good business, you also need to uh, consider these um, yeah, incomes and um, uh, costs. And um, so, and I think that's also a very important learning that you try to um, integrate this and not have separate interventions. But um, because we're also talking about businesses and households that are like, um, yeah, together in <laughs> uh, that you need to think together. So I've written already what I wanted to say that and in defense of our value chain approach, I'd like to add that. Actually, the value chain map looks at much more areas uh, than only the agricultural production. It's not only the jobs that are involved in agricultural production, but we also have our uh, value chain actors that engage in trade um, and this post-harvest management that I had asked before, for instance. Um, there are many options to engage and to involve. and. Um, apart from the agricultural production and pro productivity increase, uh, which brings me to this income generation through the productivity increase. I wonder if one of us in this round here would be uh, willing to disclose his or her definite figure of income. So how would we assume that this is feasible in the rural areas where we are working? Some things are not disclosed, so we can maybe um, generate other data that will give us a hint on these aspects. I just wanted to say that, Anna, that was very clear what you explained. And of course, the traders in the value chain are very often the engine of growth, uh, play a strong role. And regarding the income and whether we get this information, um, we will not always get all this information. But fortunately, I think it's easier to get this information about the income from our actors in the value chain than from all of us here in the webinar.